Ireland faced the Welsh fund in the form of black rock. They're essentially trying to get them to pay back all the amount of their debt. And it didn't necessarily work, but also beyond that, it wasn't even necessarily needed because Ireland ended up recovering economically anyway. That's our case. It's basically fucks over countries that otherwise would have had a path to recovery from the debt price they had in the very first place. I think our model is very clear. We're simply banning vulture funds from having the capacity to sue any of these governments in any court in the world. We have the fiat to do that. I think it's relatively clear. I think on our side of the house, we're going to prove that vulture funds are less likely. And I think that probably the alternative on our side of the house is that you get the country getting bailed out or when it defaults, or it just exogenously recovers because it's able to continue servicing its debt after the crisis in has abated. Those are the likely alternatives. I want to first be clear about why vulture funds often win these litigations and on the comparative would cease to exist. They win these litigations for five reasons. First of all, they often these litigation groups often only look at the legal aspects of the case. So they ignore the underlying macroeconomic climate because they don't necessarily focus on that. They focus on the term of the agreement of the debt, and so we're trying to honor upon that. Secondly, laws are often written by credit states, i.e. rich ones like the US and the UK, for example, so they favor repayment at all costs, and so when you sue on that basis, you tend to win on that basis. Third of all, voucher funds themselves, which often tend to be headquartered in the United States, like BlackRock, etc., have great lawyers, the best access, they have all their money invested in this process in order to win. Fourth of all, I think the kind of people who end up in these courts are often judges who tend to be retired and have very punitive ideas about what developing countries ought to do and tend to believe they mismanage things. Fifth of all, I think that even if the developing country, like when the developing or when the defaulting country is dragged into court, they often have a tendency to settle because they don't want to pay in an open-ended litigation that has almost infinite costs, given the cost of lawyers themselves are extraordinarily expensive, and so they settle and accept what the vulture fund wants. I want to be clear then about why vulture funds stop existing or far more on our side of the house. I'm genuinely not sure what other mechanism they have in order to gain this money back if they are this vulture fund buying up the debt. But also, I would know that insofar as this is the most viable mechanism that these vulture funds have used in order to extract any sort of return, that return is far more uncertain on our side of given they are cut off from this mechanism, and so we think they're likely to go fast, they don't have that certain return, meaning creditors are much more likely to cop the value of their debt and hope the country recovers or hope for our IMF beta, which we think are likely anyway. Okay, now, on to substantive material. I want to be clear that countries often uh, want to service their debt for obvious reasons because it enables them to have credit worthiness, to gain PGI, and so on. So oftentimes, when they default, this is often usually a last resort because no country would ever want to find itself in a position that does this. Which means oftentimes these defaults are caused by exogenous forces. Things like shocks, things like the 2008 financial crisis or the COVID crisis that happened most recently. And oftentimes it's not even headquarters in these countries. It's often contagion. Oftentimes the shock was unforeseen, for example. Yes, of course, sometimes it's a result of government incompetence. But we'll explain why even in those cases, this and the lack of threat of this situation is probably a positive. But we know in most cases it's exogenous. Uh, yes. The context this debate operates in are ones in which debt is heavily discounted in price, which suggests that markets do not view an organic recovery as feasible, suggesting this debate... Right, okay, okay, okay. okay. So basically, the fact that markets might view organic recovery as infeasible doesn't mean that organic recovery is infeasible. The reason is very simple. It's because obviously, when the market turns against a particular economy, I think that when all of their funds or people who are like really worried about losing value on their debt, for example, when that shifts, oftentimes they move as a herd and so they pivot away from that recovery possibly. So for example, with Greece, underlyingly it's fundamental we're probably going to be okay with within the EU, we're probably able to redevelop. But when investors turn against it, that was something that happened on max. But also, even if the debt is extremely depressed, I think it'll turn to things like bailouts which are better. Okay, so on that side of the house, we think then that you force these countries to pay back a huge amount of money. Because no, it's not just the servicing cost of the debt, I mean, it's not just the interest rate, it's the underlying value of the debt itself, which is an extreme cost to these countries. And I think that is absolutely awful, because oftentimes it means that you are forced to abandon important things in fiscal policy. Things like welfare, for example, that pay out to the poorest people who have the highest marginal price to consume, and so are most likely to consume during a crisis. Things like education that can redevelop your people who live within your country and so enable a longer term recovery, for example, as well. So you just are forced to abandon all of those things because you have to pay this extraordinarily high cost or you're spooked and so you accept a very favorable settlement to these vulture funds. Second of all, I think this oftentimes fucks up politics in these countries as well for the reason that obviously when you are forced to pay 
you know, a Belgian fund that often has its headquarters in some uh, United States or whatever it is, I think that's likely to be perceived as something that is perceived as something that's absolutely awful. You like to lose trust in those countries in general because you view them as massively oppressing you, for example. The third of all, I think that like even the process of litigation itself is really bad for these countries. Remember my framing, which is that oftentimes these are during times of crisis. So even just spending any level of time and focus on this is time that is missed that you could be using to read about your economy, given that each individual decision in a crisis is absolutely crucial, because each decision has long-term effects and hysteresis effects as well. On our side of the house, I think the first likelihood is you know, just an exogenous recovery, because um, you know, oftentimes the shock abates, for example, COVID ends until you're able to recover, and, and you know, people eventually come in because they view your debt as being distressed and being at a discounted rate, and so investors come in and buy it up anyway because they view the market as underpricing it. Or, second of all, even if it is the case that like the alternative on our side of the house is a bailout or something like that, we are happy to cop that. Because at the very least, if it is a bailout, oftentimes those bailouts are done with like you know, by the IMF, done with consideration of the underlying economic circumstances, and so are far less punitive than these kinds of uh, measures. But also, second of all, the IMF is a very good actor in general. It has far better policies than economists post-2008, where it faced some level of backlash, and so we think it's much more likely to put you on a path to recovery. So, in the cases where the debt crisis caused by endogenous fuck-ups the government has done, we think that in, so far as they get bailed out by the IMF, that bailout is conditional on passing these good policies, we still win because we get them put past but put back on the path of recovery. The last thing I want to talk about in this week is the long-term functioning of the debt market. They might say that you get more people willing to lend to countries in the very first place for the reason that you know they are guaranteed some of the But oftentimes the benefits of this litigation of, often go to the vulture fund and investors still lose out because they are having to sell their debt for a highly, highly discounted rate. So I don't think you get more lenders on their side, but what you might get is countries selling to people who are far less willing to sell to vulture funds in the first place. States, for example, like China, who often impose far more punitive measures in other ways when they buy up the debt rather than individual capital investors as well. At the end of the day, then, these vulture funds are exploiting the uh, legalistic system, and so we think they have to be stopped. Very proud to be first. I'll spend the first half of this speech providing the two central claims of opening opposition. The first is that big claim that if you stop vulture funds from being able to sue, you'll get a critical decline in investment in these countries. But the issue that their mechanism fails, and fails completely, is because it's never the investors that see that much of their money back. Because when the vulture funds buy up this, this debt for cents on the dollar, the investors only get cents on the dollar. So why is it that there is such a low price when these vulture funds acquire the debt? The, the reason is that the vulture funds have all of the leverage. First of all, there are very, very few of them in any particular transaction. We would know there are few of them to begin with. First of all, there's just not that much of this rotten debt going around, so there's not that much to sustain a large number of vulture funds. Second of all, it requires highly specific expertise in many fields. The debt of these particular countries, the macroeconomic conditions surrounding them, the legal process, and all sorts of other things. But third of all, the returns for vulture investment are highly irregular, so and often there's a very long time in between returns, which means that the small ones are likely to lose all of their good stuff if you have a really good period of economic conditions globally. And so there's only a few big ones that survive. But also we know for any particular deal, you're likely to have few buyers. Often they just want to pass on a particular deal, or it requires very specific expertise in a particular area of the economy. Whereas, on the other side, there are all sorts of creditors that they can buy from, and so they can offer the creditors really shitty returns. But second of all, we would for the creditors. The alternative is that just they get nothing, right? And so they're willing to sell for one cent, because the alternative is they just get zero cents on the dollar, which means that the vast, vast majority of the money ends up in the pockets of vulture funds rather than the original investors. So, if you're an investor, the only difference on opening opposition, or the opposition bench in general, is rather than losing 90, like rather than losing your full dollar that you invested, you lose 99 cents of that dollar that you invested. So first of all, we would notice this is just a tiny difference to begin with, and so insofar as they have all sorts of other things that factor into their calculation, this is the tiniest little tidbit of an impact. But second of all, there's just not that many vulture funds, there's just not that many cases that end up going to these particular courts, and so there are just so few cases, even if there's quite a big difference in these instances, that this actually makes that much of a difference. Yeah. Also, we would note that these countries are probably not going to be able to borrow that much into the future, or they're not going to attract much investment, if this is the government that literally just tried not to pay its debt back, right? And so on their side, investment is still just as hamstrung, but also we would note that 
you know, most of the other factors still apply. Like, often these countries have fantastic growth rates. Often there is just like a really broad base of educated workers or whatever. So they still attract investment either way. I'll take closing. No me? Mm, right. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing I'm going to respond to is that this deters bad government. The first thing that we know is there's probably already deterrence enough, right? For instance, if you run a really shitty economy, your currency plummets. And this is critical because most of the people in power, you know, they run assets in these particular countries. So even if they have some money stashed overseas, most of their income is in the local currency. So if that currency loses value, they personally end up poorer. But also, if the currency crashes, you're likely to have people rioting in the streets, which means you lose your grip on power. You're more likely to get voted out. Or in the case of a sort of democracy, you're far more likely to face destabilizing protests. You're far more likely to face investor flight, which threatens everyone's wealth and your wealth. But also, it just leads to broader economic trouble. It leads to higher borrowing costs in the future, which means that your ability to govern into the future is significantly lessened. So insofar as this is maybe one tiny little thing that deters bad government, there is already all sorts of things that deter bad government. But second of all, we don't think this particularly deters bad governments. Because we would note that actually having vulture funds trying to like slaughter this particular country is something that's often quite good for the governments. Because what it looks like is you have evil foreign creditors that are ruining your economy, taking the blame from the government that's mismanaging the economy, and so they can say, look at these evil little like George Soros types and say, well, we're not the bad guys. You need to have a strong government like us in power who resists these evil types overseas. So it actually doesn't weaken the government. In fact, it incentivizes bad government to give you a nice scapegoat. But also, bad governments, I think, is quite smart. So let's move on to the particular harms that we bring in at opening government of, of vulture funds and with, that we stop by, allowing, by stopping them from suing. The first is we get rid of a really, really bad political problem that happens when you let vulture funds sue. We would note this is a high profile event when they sue countries and it looks abysmal. Because what you have is a poor state that is struggling to repay its debts and a very, very rich creditor that drags them to court in London, bludgeons them with a particular, you know, into repaying debt. And sure, they can say, we'll do it in the IMF and World Bank as if they don't have as bad an image problem. Even though they're always run by the EU and the US who have veto power and literally staff the top ranks of those organizations the whole time. And so we would note that this critically drives <laughs> anti-West sentiment in these areas. Which means, basically, because you vilify the West, it is the most nakedly exploitative policy that I can think of, where you get the poorest countries and you just force them to repay something which they seem completely unable to repay. Which means, first of all, these particular states oppose the West, but second of all, like, other states are going to see this. They don't see the West as a particular ethical actor, which means, if, even if we're restricting this debate purely to investment, which is opening up opening opposition to fixation, if these countries' governments are vilifying the West, if the West is unpopular in these areas, they lose access to by far the largest stream of foreign direct investment because there are seen to be far larger political risks than ever before. But also we know there are other problems. You need to have international cooperation if you're going to have cooperation on things like climate change, or for instance the war in Ukraine, or just to lead to general stability in the area. Close. The top PM says the alternative he would rather countries turn to is the IMF. Why doesn't that turn all of these? Well, there's a difference between taking them to an IMF court and demanding draconian repayments, and the IMF coming in, maybe demanding a few things, but ultimately giving them a lot of money in bailout. Sure, maybe the extent of our impact isn't as full as it could possibly be, but there's certainly a large enough margin that is a very significant integration in this way. Finally, why the process of court-ordered repayments are awful? Sure, they can say you'll do this in the World Bank or the IMF, but we think the terms that debtor countries are going to get are still abysmal when faced with vulture funds. For the reason that the US and the EU control this, for the reason that they still use common law, which was written by an aristocracy and imposed on a poorer people in, country, in, in these countries, which means that you are actually going to have really strict repayments. And even if these things on their side don't go to court and it just goes to negotiations, the fact that the creditors can threaten the vultures can threaten these countries with going to court, and, and the fact that they're going to lose when they go to court, means that the negotiations are really lopsided in the face of, in the favour of the vulture funds. And so what this means is, these countries are forced to repay debts that they never wanted to repay. Because we noted that, repay, that choosing not to repay a debt is always the last resort, because it is so bad for your economy, because it's so bad for foreign direct investment. Which means that when you have to pay these debts that are impossible to repay, you suck all of the money out of the most necessary things. You're not cutting fat, you're cutting muscle, you're cutting education and health, and infrastructure spending, all of the most important things in this debate. And when they say, well, you want to pay back the debt, you don't want to suck them dry, this is only about the vulture funds trying to get this debt rather than all creditors into the future. For all these reasons, it is a disastrous thing that they exist, that's why we have to stop them from suing. Thank you very much for that.
speech and to close the top half, I'd like to invite the, the deputy leader of the opposition. <laughs> In Proposition's world, you have a choice. A choice between either investment being squeezed from any country perceived as high risk, even if it doesn't get to the point of defaulting, knowing there's a much larger number of countries than the countries that they're claiming affects, or an IMF bailout, where the IMF is the one imposing austerity on you, where the anti Western sentiments they describe don't happen through a settlement that your country volunteered into, but instead the IMF literally telling you, we will not bail you out unless you cut public spending. So the blame most squarely falls on the West and creates the anti Western sentiments that Mark is terrified of. We want to escape that choice in opposition's world. I want to chat first about why this actually guts investment that countries need. Critically, this is not just countries that are likely to be poor. This is countries that are at higher risk of facing the exogenous shocks that Aniket describes. Because if they are at high risk of a shock, even if the shock doesn't actually happen or materialize, they are squeezed from investment, meaning they have to cut essential spending on healthcare, on education, and on infrastructure. Their main response is investors don't really see their money back when a vulture fund is involved because they just get cents on the dollar. Their first reason for this is there's very few vulture funds competing for this month. I want to first observe that any given investing country has a very obvious outside option, which is they can sue the country themselves rather than relying on a vulture fund. <laughs> Critically, therefore, what vulture funds offer is specialization. The capacity to give them access to specialized lawyers, the capacity to know how these courts operate, and to win cases in a meaningful way. This is critical because countries still need a vulture funds. They lose a lot of these cases without the help of the specialized vulture funds. Companies that buy bonds in developing countries need to outsource a lot of their work to vulture funds. They do have an unreliable outside option, but that serves as competition that ensures they are not just selling their debt at cents on the dollar. But second, I reject that claim that there's very few vulture funds. Here's the justifications they give. The first one is, there are very few of them empirically. Not true, there are many larger funds empirically. Quite literally because there are tons of high-risk countries and tons of financial firms that have access to a large amount of expertise. They say second, returns are irregular. Irregular returns? The five reasons they give us for why vulture funds will routinely win their cases in court means their returns are likely to be pretty highly regular. And this is critical because vulture funds are able, to, are able to profit even during good periods. Why? One, because they are highly diversified because they are often elements of financial firms like BlackRock in Ireland that Aniket describes. That means you can profit in good times and you can profit in bad times. On top of which, good times are often the times when the debt is repaid without you having to pursue litigation, at which point you're still able to profit as a vulture fund off of that. These are all good reasons why there are relatively large numbers of vulture funds competing for this money. And the alternative is not zero cents, it's just a worse negotiation and a worse settlement because your lawyers are worse than the vulture funds' lawyers. This means vulture funds are giving you money. Now I want to respond to their claim from closing governments that why would you invest in these countries if they were literally failed countries? Here's the argument that we are making. There are some countries that have a risk of exogenous shock, disaster-prone countries, countries that are prone to experience conflict. In these countries, the panic investors Aniket describes are incredibly important in deciding whether a hedge fund or a major financial firm buys their bonds. On their side of the house, when you do not have the option of a vulture fund, because they can see a vulture fund is literally killed and an unsustainable profit-making enterprise, then in the event that the debt goes bad, you have no option to get it back, or you have to rely on your own extremely incompetent lawyers who aren't nearly as specialized in dealing with these cases in court. Sorry? No, thank you. This is critical because it meaningfully squeezes investment. Maybe not entirely, but caution. The other piece of preemption is, well, there are investors like China, states like China often engage in predatory investment in the, in the PM. 
I want, actually want to flip this claim. You're much more likely to turn to investors who don't care that much about recovering the money because they can seize your collateral instead. So a lot of the loans that are extremely exploitative, either from countries or corporations, often involve agreeing to build projects that governments agree on, see Kenya's SGR, because they're extremely short-term projects. You recover the money in the long run, or if you don't recover the money, you don't particularly care about meaning a voucher fund because you recover the asset and then dump that country with extremely cheap goods that their domestic industries can't compete. Right. So either you turn your bank into worse forms of funding, or you are capital squeezed. This outweighs every single claim of this. Why? Because all their claims only apply in their cases where the default actually happens. There are many cases where we don't get to the situation in the first place because any high-risk country loses a large amount of investment. So there's a much larger spectrum of countries. It's also critical because those are the set of countries that we don't have the ability to use money well. So when they say austerity is bad, it's not clear these governments are spending money on good, responsible projects but they are at a point where they are defaulting on a loan. We apply to countries that are spending this money substantially better. Second, I want to talk about what, whether we worsen or better debt crisis. They basically say austerity bad. This is an extremely uncompetitive argument because you are turning to a bailout from the IMF. And I can briefly hint this is other alternative where someone buys your debt anyway. Cool, if it's bad debt, you need a vulture fund. If you kill vulture funds, you don't have any other alternative except an IMF bailout. First, I would note for many countries, IMF bailouts don't really exist as an alternative. Quite simply because the IMF is increasingly capital squeezed, especially in a world where it expects more and more bailouts to happen in the aftermath of COVID, where country balance sheets are much, much worse. Fine. Before I move on, close it. Yeah, we talk about how original original creditors can sue the country themselves. Please talk a bit more about who these original creditors are and what the suing process is. So I've already explained these. The things like credit funds, they might sue in arbitration, but they don't really have specialization or divisions in their companies for this. I'm excited to see what your extension is. Okay, let's talk about why this actually worsens debt prices in these countries. The critical argument we make is a moral hazard argument. That if you have a, if you have a belief that the IMF will bail you out, and no belief that a vulture fund is coming after you to collect your money, you are more likely to engage in irresponsible spending in the first place. And this is critical, because even if you are able to get a bailout in the long run, engaging in a large amount of spending right now means you are borrowing and issuing government bonds. That means people aren't investing in your company's bonds because government bonds are in the market. Companies are able to raise less money, lay off a lot more people. Their argument is there's deterrence because your currency plummets. There are people like George Soros out there ready to control your currency. One, which of these countries has tons of capital and mobility? If you are engaging in tons of borrowing, quite plausibly, you are imposing massive capital controls that prevent capital from leaving your country nearly as much to allow your currency to plummet. But second, we established that governments often have short-term incentives when they care about things like the upcoming election. This matters because if default might have implications on their economy in the long run, like the effects of their currency plummeting, but the immediate cost to their economy is not nearly as large when they can simply sell it off as we are able to spend money. But spending money is not an inherently good thing. It means prices of goods go up and it means governments are far more irresponsible. Very bad people. <laughs> Speech and now moving on to the closing cap of the table. I'm happy to introduce the member of government. <laughs> Banks. 
The first reason is that these financial institutions are more carefully regulated because they are intertwined with the local economy and therefore there's more scrutiny and restrictions. They don't engage in exploitative lawsuits and are therefore more likely to engage in better negotiations like debt restructuring, waiting out for economic recovery, or staggering interest payments into the future. But the second reason is that these financial institutions have a variety of other cash flows. They have reserve requirements that are implemented by governments. They can have cash flows from their other performing loans to other businesses. They have treasury bonds that give them regular cash payments. All of this means that these other financial institutions are in a much better position to withstand a country not paying back debt. Compared to voucher funds, they are almost entirely reliant on countries paying back the sovereign loan in order for them to get money back. Which means that voucher funds have an incentive to act in a lot more aggressive and exploitative ways because they have to pay back their shareholders immediately and get a return on the sovereign debt that they bought. Compared to all of these financial institutions, which are incredibly diversified, have multiple different forms of cash flow, and therefore can wait for longer periods where they are unable to get the debt back, which means that they are more likely to consider more careful forms of negotiation like debt restructuring. What is the impact of this not yet? Opening government explains why the vouchers will win the settlement and why it's very terrible for the country. In closing government, we will explain why the process of litigation leads to a lot of harms. Countries do not want to declare bankruptcy because it really hurts their credit rating. They don't want to enter litigation because it's expensive, time-consuming, and politically unpopular. Given that the threat of litigation is present when it's not banned, countries will do everything in their power to avoid the instances where they have to go to court with these of Japan. And this means when they act in such desperate measures, they will engage in a variety of poor policies in order to desperately need the interest payment and avoid going to court in the first place. What were these terrible policies? I have about six things to chat about. The first is that they will use their foreign reserves in order to make their interest payments. This is incredibly dangerous because they have less money to depend your currency on a foreign exchange. It risks massive currency depreciation and imports become a lot more expensive, causing inflation, or foreign loans become a lot more expensive, causing debt spirals for domestic companies. Second impact, raise taxes that destroy savings and hurts disposable income and hurts domestic demand. It causes huge amounts of political instability, it's incredibly unpopular, and it hurts the country's long-term ability to recover into the future. The third impact is that you liquidate assets. You sell your land and your assets. You lose control of valuable assets that generate profit for your country, like your mines and your oil rigs, in order to desperately meet the interest payments so that you're not brought to court by this voucher fund. Fifth impact, you loan more money from other central banks and financial institutions. These loans are likely going to have higher interest payments because the country's credit rating is already tanking and already spiraling. This is going to cause a debt spiral within the country. It means that you're just displacing this current in um, problem further into the future where the default is likely to be much worse because the way in which you avoid this current interest payment is by taking more loans and then will causing more problems into the future. Sixth reason, the long litigation process causes more investor uncertainty. This splits the claim coming from opening opposition. Foreign investors are unlikely going to invest. Current creditors are going to activate margin calls to demand their principal payment back because they're not sure what the outcome of the litigation is. They're not sure whether the country will be successfully sued. They're not sure whether the country will be immediately paid back the principal amount they initially loaned. All of this uncertainty is hugely risky for all foreign investors, which means that they're likely going to pour out their money again. It causes less liquidity within the domestic country's economy. It causes less ability for you to get foreign direct investments, which many countries and many businesses are relying on. Foreign on yes. A default is much more likely to induce these outcomes of scaring foreign investors because you didn't pay the money back. And if you claim the IMF bails you out, then the IMF can give you a swap line to give you currency during this Wait, this is not a case line. A case line is not that the IMF will build out. A case line is that all of the other creditors are going to engage in things like debt restructuring. All of these things don't risk the default. What happens on their side of the house is that the voucher funds will never engage in such lengthy processes because they don't have the incentive to do so and they want the money back immediately. It is the incentive to aggressively pursue the repayments back that causes all of these bad policy makings where the creditors are more diversified and balanced on outside the house and have better incentive and are better regulated. This is where we avoid the harms of default. Also because these these creditors don't want the country to default. The central claim coming from opening opposition is that this encourages accountability. Opening government says that there are other ways to encourage accountability, like being poor or poor economies is incredibly unpopular. I want to directly respond to this claim coming from opening opposition. If feasible debt restructuring was possible, this would be already pursued by the creditors, and it's already something that's being pursued by the creditors. So right now, if a creditor sees the opportunity for debt restructuring, they will enter these negotiations with the, the country that they are loaning the money to. But this never happens when you give them an easy out, which they can just reduce the risk immediately and sell it to work for all these voucher funds. 
So all of the incentives to take long processes and negotiate that restructuring, all of the incentives to do things like stagger interest payments and displace it in the future, is immediately gone because they immediately cut your losses now by sending it to all of these voucher funds. They are incredibly, in huge proportions, they are always ready to buy all of these sovereign debt. This is terrible because all of the bad policies that we explain will happen on our side of the house are bad policy makes, are, are, are bad policies, and are, are the convoy and are incredibly undemocratic. This suggests that the kind of policies that litigation triggers on their side of the house are the ones that are infeasible and massive harms are caused. All of these policies on the, on, that will be activated on their side of the house are done out of desperation in order to massively avoid the immediate short term harm of entering litigation with a voucher fund that's incredibly scary and incredibly likely to demand things like swing. This is why there's best accountability on opposition. The reason why this is the most important claim in this debate is because the initial credit that like the European banks or the US banks on the outside of the house can wait out this period of time. But now in which we are given an easy out, we're going to sell towards all of these voucher funds and activate all the harms that we talked about. Voucher funds demanding it now pushes countries to make terrible decisions and weaken the economy. And this argument weighs significantly in the law. Because, as all other teams have acknowledged, the ability for economic recovery into the future is incredibly uncertain. The ability for you to recover is based on a variety of other external factors, like whether the government invests in certain key industrial sectors or whether you in inject stimulus into the economy to increase consumer demand. All of the ability for you to economic recovery in the future, to have a stable economy that will allow you to be strong, is diminished when the government acts in desperate measures, when the, their policy making is obfuscated by the fact that they are desperately trying to meet all of these voucher payments and also all of these countries demanding the sovereign debt at once. Therefore, the, the reason why this claim weighs heavier than the claims coming from opening government is because opening government primarily talks about the end conclusion. They explain why the suing will lead to massive economic harm for the, for the Country. But this harm is small compared to the long process of litigation, while the harms of investors' confidence being hurting during the period of litigation hurts investors' confidence. But more importantly, all the policy outcomes that trigger this spiral towards the entire economy are massive on outside the house, way above opening government, purely on scale. But the most important outcome that you will credit closing government for is that it hurts the ability for these country, uh, countries to recover into the future because it weakens economic fundamentals through poor policy making because governments act in incredibly desperate and irrational ways. <laughs> Speech and to introduce the closing opposition, I'd like to invite the member of the opposition. Here, here. power to control the entirety of emerging markets. The reality is that vulture funds, in most instances, buy somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of a country's debt on secondary markets, utilize specific litigation tactics to achieve some level of profit from that. Why structurally is this the most likely characterization in the debate? First, given the riskiness of this strategy, the vast majority of vulture funds are unable to approve multi-trillion dollar asset portfolios. The reason being, they can only access so much capital. And the reason that matters is that governments issue billions of dollars in debt, which means your ability to then buy that debt on secondary markets can rarely eclipse 15 or 20 percent of the outstanding quantity of debt in the market. Second, as closing government identifies, the vast majority of debt issued by emerging markets is typically held by large financial institutions. But these financial institutions are not idiots. Guess what? When Argentina went bankrupt for like the gazillionth time, it was not a shocker to the world. No one was like, oh, gee, who saw that one coming? The reason that matters is large financial institutions heavily exposed to these countries were well aware of the risk they were taking on and often are unwilling to sell even when times get tough because they're in it for the restructure deal. They're in it to see the country grow in the long term, which means in the vast bulk of instances, 70, 80 percent of the debt isn't being sold by the current holders. The third and most obvious reason, though, is given, interestingly, by opening government themselves. They say there are so few of these vulture funds. They have such little money. It's so specialized. So OG can see this. What does this do to the debate? 
First, it heavily mitigates the harms coming from both government teams, closing government in particular. Because if you listen to closing government's extension, the logical endpoint presumably is that vulture funds have such vast economic and litigatory power over these countries, such as the one cause currency crises and mass devaluation of the national economy. In the vast majority of cases, that's not true. It is true there is some level of economic pain. But that level of economic pain is substantially less significant than closing up the scribes because other investors still want their money back at some point in time, right? Like other investors still want the country to restructure. The IMF still demands structural austerity from you. And so it's not clear why vulture funds are meaningfully different than the interests of other investors to get their money back. This also mitigates opening government's claim on the fiscal resource source trade-off, because it is true that the vulture fund gets a money out of the litigation settlement, but it's not true that you're destroying the national electricity grid or bankrupting the local hospital system. This does not flip up rent, to be clear, but it mitigates the strength of their benefit and therefore paves the way for closing opposition's extension. There is one miscellaneous strand of opening government, which is the claim that this is really bad because it's seen as anti-Western. In many instances, this is symmetric, and the response to the POI is weak. Because if OG's concession is you otherwise need foreign capital and need the IMF, then the margin becomes how much more anti-Western do you feel in response to a Volcker fund versus the IMF? And the likely answer is not very. One, the media sensationalizes either story because the facts and reality of what's happening is probably good for your country. The reason the anti-Western section is in is because the media portrays this as evil, which happens either way given yeah. capitalist incentives. But secondarily, the anti-Western narrative that open and government fails exists, interestingly enough, in the West as well, because Argentina was not the only country that was irritated by NML capital in 2011. It was also the United States. It was voters in the European Union who pushed heavily politically for reform of ultra funds, for demanding that the IMF be less hawkish in its imposition of austerity measures, which means this measure exists outside of developing countries as well. Given that we've mitigated both Gulf teams heavily, let's explain in terms of extension, why banning vulture funds de facto greatly harms the fiscal and economic viability of emerging markets. There are four mechanisms in this argument. The first and most important is a better explanation of opening opposition on why this policy causes debt crises that otherwise don't happen. Opening opposition's argument confuses primary and secondary debt markets, because their argument is you will make it harder for a country to recover from, say, a, a, a monsoon. But the problem is that this is a debate about selling your secondary bond, right? So the money and the proceeds of that sale don't meaningfully go to the government. The better argument from closing opposition is not that this policy will reduce investment, but that their policy will increase fire selling when a country nears the precipice of default. Why is that likely to happen for the 20 or 30 percent of investors with money they're willing to sell? Because as a country approaches default, panic rips markets as both government teams identify. And it's difficult to understand in advance whether the country will default. Like, on our side of the house, though, there is important knowledge. There will be vulture funds willing to buy your debt at some partial discount in the event that a default actually appears likely in six weeks or two months. The problem on their side of the house is that no one fills that void. Vulture funds functionally vanish, and either no other financial institution is willing to buy that debt, or more likely, it's some hedge fund that's literally willing to buy it for pennies on the dollar. The reason that therefore matters is there is a first mover advantage on their side of the house to sell off first, because you know every other fund on the street has the same exact thought. There will not be a vulture fund to buy my distressed bond if the country actually defaults. The reason that then matters is there is a strong preemptive incentive to sell off now, because there is still some someone on the other side of that transaction who's willing to buy at a fair price. This doesn't happen on our side, given the comfort that comes from knowing the vulture fund exists. Why does this flip government back? Because government's claim is that debt crises are bad and vulture funds make it worse. Sure, but what's much worse is causing a debt crisis that otherwise ever began. The reason they cause more debt crises is because they make it harder for countries to refinance existing debts. The reason why is because once on their side of the house, I'll take OG in a moment, you have the depreciation of bonds as a consequence of fire selling, you destroy market confidence in that economy, OG. Um, unfortunately, you framed out your own extension because it's, it's, it seems 100 percent of investors are afraid, but these vulture funds can only buy up 10 to 15 percent of the debt, still get a fire sale. Yes. 
So the point is not that the uh, JP Morgan fire sells. The point is there is 30, 40% of the market that is going to fire sell. They do not fire sell on our side of the house because the economy doesn't default. And they know that if a default actually appears imminent, they have the capability to sell at a 60 or 50% discount. On their side of the house, that discount becomes Get like 80, 90% because there is no other backer on the opposing side of that sale. Why does this matter? Because the argument is about perception, not about actuality. If 40% of your market sells off your bonds in a fire sale event on their side of the house, the signaling effect to markets is the government is no longer fiscally sustainable. The reason that then matters is that government's ability to issue new bonds to repay the old, as most countries do because they're unable to increase their economic growth sufficiently to repay old interest rates, their capacity to refinance deteriorates. This is the real cause of financial crisis on opening and closing government. A country that has sound economic fundamentals that never otherwise would have collapsed has the signaling effect that deteriorates its capability to reissue bonds. See ya. Thank you very much for that beautiful sort of speech. And I'm happy to welcome the government whip. Here we are. by positioning Haven's extension and identifying where it responds to all the other teams. First big claim we get from Haven that he proves is that the counter backfall on our side is likely to be best, which he gives you structural reasons are far better because they are diversified. They don't need these loans to be paid back instantly because they are not relying on litigation as their main source of income. He talks about how they are largely flexible with installments, etc., etc. This then means that the whole discussion of IMF bailouts is just not relevant to our case because everything OG says is true about how the IMF might be good, but it's unclear why the IMF is the vast majority of cases because we engage with opening opposition who argues that the IMF is often just not an option for a lot of these defaulting states. And therefore, our case is not touched by OG's response to OG on the idea of the IMF. This also responds to opening opposition who claims that original creditors can sue the country themselves and that's why vulture funds are better at getting a chance to respond with an EOI and want to hear it now, so here we go. We think this state was comparative because Cayman explains that what these original creditors look like, that these vulture funds lie from. These are often objectively just the banks that the US and EU banks that opening government talks about, but also like the Asian Development Bank, which is just objectively responsible for financing a large amount of loans in status quo, which is then the reason as to why on our side you get a lot more responsible economic policies from these countries because they're not forced to pay back their loans immediately, the more responsible and more flexible with negotiations. We think on it that's far better for long-term fiscal policy for the vast majority of these defaulting states. Moving on then to closing opposition, just a quick response. Closing opposition claims that vulture funds are reasonable because litigation is incredibly high risk. Kevin explains to you that these defaulting countries are often forced into desperate measures to pay for that really expensive litigation process. And the vulture funds know that it's not high risk because they know that these defaulting countries can offer to the many harms that Kevin talks to you about as an effort to repay these loans. This is why when closing opposition says that fire selling increases on government because the defaulting process seems fair, this is just uncomparative because it ignores how the government counterfactual is just far more reliable banks who in status quo diversify the sources of their funds by buying out these loans on our side of the house as supposed to rely on these vulture funds. And that's also why when closing opposition says that hedge funds are really, really bad, you will buy 
high rent at a discount. That's exactly what vulture funds are. That happens on their side of the house. And therefore, on scale, the harms of litigation is much larger. The counterfeit will but proves to you at closing government yeah. is far better. Sit down. Moving on then to opening opposition on this idea that they increase accountability. So opening government, sort of OO, makes it seem like developing countries are very sneaky and very smart and they like avoiding debt because they're just very smart. They have very corrupt governments. OG responds by saying, no, no, countries don't like being in debt for a series of practical harms. The response here is to say that even if this is true, these countries, when they are in a state of distressed debt, that already means they have exhausted all debt restructuring options. This is like even with authoritarian governments, all oh, doesn't mean we change anything. Just being in a state of distressed debt means that you have already exhausted all other possibilities to pay off that debt, which is why you are in that state of just distressed debt. This is why when closing opposition says that investors still want their money back so that they because so they want restructuring because they don't want the economy to go like go to shit. This is no longer an option because the debate where this development takes place when all options have been exhausted, oh, countries on their side are incredibly desperate, will opt into the harms that Stephen talks about in his speech. All of those harms are unlocked on their side of the house. The second big claim we get from Kevin that again he proves is idea that countries, when they are forced to raise money to fund litigation, they are left with a series of really harmful options. How does this respond to all the teams in this debate? All the opposition claims that developing countries already have alternatives. They give a one-liner about how they already have very educated workforces. Not really sure in most instances. OG also gives you sorry, that's OG. OG also gives you some lazy argumentation on how you abandon fiscal policy that is just really bad for countries who can't focus on infrastructure. For most of these defaulting countries, the hearts are a lot more concrete and there's hard are more harmful to them on scale, proven to you by Kevin's reasons, which I will get to in a bit. But this also is a response to opening opposition. Because opening opposition claims that on status quo, they're like these countries are like dying and they are failing in many particular ways and that investor confidence is very low. We think on status quo, developing countries already have alternative forms of investment that are just harm on their side of the house, so you have to sacrifice these industries for you to repay your debts. So even if the ability to sue is the tipping point on their side of the house, we prove to you the counter capital is much better. Here is where I weigh it out. Several reasons. Firstly, he would talk so about how these countries are forced to sell these reserves. Things like currency depreciation, where they don't have money to defend their currency. It's incredibly bad for defaulting countries because it creates ripple effects in the economy, where these countries are forced to have more expensive exports and they're unable to compete competitively with other countries within the region. Overall, bad for the economy overall. The second point of weighing here is that Kevin talks to you about raising taxes. It is likely what countries are forced into because it's the easiest for them to do because they have much control over their domestic fiscal policy. It is worse for all the people on the ground because you worsen their quality of living when prices are incredibly, incredibly expensive and their purchasing power does not change. Third point of weighing, Kevin talks to you about how these countries are likely to take on more debt to pay for that existing debt. This is called over leverage. So you get more sovereign debt to pay existing sovereign debt and it's incredibly harmful for these countries because when they already have debt, that means their credit, their credit rating really sucks. So when they take on more debt, the interest rates are already incredibly higher. So they're stuck in a cycle of debt which unlocks this long-term harm on their side of the house where it's harder for you to fund existing economic and development policies because you are stuck with all these restrictions on your economy. Before you go on to the fourth point of way, opening. 15 seconds. You wouldn't sell at a discount to a vulture fund if you can just restructure and we explain vulture funds are often as diversified as banks. Our impacts on investment apply even when debt is not distressed yet because expectations about the secondary market affect whether you lend on the primary market. One, the first five seconds of your POI points out that these are debates in which you can no longer have these structuring alternatives. Again, these are countries who are probably in an incredibly desperate position. Second point, we already proved why these vulture funds are not diversified because they are relying on this one source of income. Even if they are diversified, you have to compare this to our alternative on banks or even more diversified because that's their entire thing. That's the entire thing, guys, guys. Come on. Fourth point of playing that. But on their side of the house, these defaulting countries are more likely to do things like sell land. This is true for the vast majority of developing economies. Really bad for these countries because they rely a lot on things like arable land, which is their biggest asset, because that's how they get investors to commit to develop that land, create resorts, create tourism. That's how they manage to invest in agriculture, or they just this case because they have large booming populations. So for a lot of these countries, Kevin proves you nuanced parts as to what the existing profitable industries look like and what happens to these industries when they are forced to opt into the incredibly harmful litigation. This flips the point from opening opposition who says that they get more investment. Even if they do get that investment, you scare all of that away by having the comparative advantage of these countries hard because governments now are in a lengthy process where it's uncertain if they will win the litigation. If it's uncertain how much money they will have to put into litigation and therefore it's unclear what the purchasing power of people on the ground are, unclear what the government budget is and therefore all the FBI that these countries are relying because they don't have very strong existing economies or strong infrastructure now are taken away. We prove 
significant harm on their side that kind of people have to oppose. <laughs> much for that speech and the last speech for today I'd like to invite the opposition with yeah. government than we want to switch it. First, I think it was the strongest OG, gov OG claim that has not yet been responded to by OO is the fact that because vulture funds have lots of leverage over other, over, over other investors, therefore they have huge amounts of bargaining power with all of these bills that they offer that. But the reason they give me there are very few vulture funds. But what? Vulture funds have to often sell at reasonable prices because they face huge amounts of financial regulation. But second, vulture funds often do not have all the leverage because they need to convince larger, other different types of financial institution investors to sell hefty shares of government bonds. This is because vulture funds need to get at least 15 or 10 percent of the bonds to override collective acting clauses so they can stop debt restructuring. This reason alone feeds out the analysis coming from OG. But moreover, many vulture funds exist because past cases like Argentina have shown that this is a strategy that is hugely profitable. So more vulture funds actually have a rise post that. And it's not just subdivisions of huge funds like BlackRock. Right. It is also independent vulture funds that are currently existed <coughs> that are also investing in the game. The second thing we get from OG is that resources used to engage in litigation comes at the cost of better social welfare spending to recover from the economic crisis, especially when governments only default and want to default on last resort. What? Given there are never cases of corruption or financial mismanagement, it is unclear what the scale is. Gov at least needs to prove why the money will overwhelmingly likely go into schools and hospitals here, here. instead of the military and patronage networks. But also, note what this, this response does. It doesn't take out the OG claim, but it explains a huge logical deficiency in the biggest impact they want to access. That means that the argument's scale and impact is heavily mitigated. But let's actually flip their argument. In fact, in cases where the government needs to repay debt on our side, don't call my name, given huge pressure from citizens already, but they are poor, they are struggling, and they are likely already rioting on the streets. Crackdowns or crackdowns of corruption, decreasing payments immediately to your elite friends are more likely because the comparative is getting significantly more political pressure in those instances of distress and of the large amount of public dissent. Means you are more likely to get removed from power when you don't satisfy those people's needs compared to convincing your friends to hold out like wait, five years when it comes to repay money to them. The second response to this is Given governments have little incentive to repay this debt, and the interest rates of that debt ends up on them. So, given they claim that governments have little incentive to repay this debt, and that, but the, and that the fact that the interest rate of those debts are not compounding over time. So maybe in the short run, you believe that uh, you believe that governments are able to do things like social welfare spending, but when they are able to be led like poorly by delaying debt repayment and instead providing social services. The problem is that over time in the long run, this is an unsustainable way, and governments eventually run out of resources to achieve what they want to do. Therefore, solutions to recover with economic crisis don't work in the long run of their status, and they don't end up materializing in, in meaningful ways, because often you just need a good amount of time to recover with economic crisis. Maybe you believe the exhaustion or shock only existed for two years, but often rebuilding that, rebuilding this investor confidence and making sure people are spending money in the economy takes a lot longer than that. The third response is, you're probably now asking, why would this all matter if the IMF would just bail them out in good ways that OG wants to talk about? But here's the problem. There's a timeline issue. The IMF often only bails out countries when they, they, it is an extremely obsolete state, when they do extremely little or no chance of those countries Point. recovering on their own and being able to restructure their own debt. Why? 
The IMF wants to get set good precedents of bailouts to disincentivize corrupt and fiscally okay, irresponsible yeah. governments from not repaying their loans and debt. What does this mean? People are often deprived of well-being in the interim period. And given immense uncertainty whether the IMF would bail the country out in the first place, it is likely investors wouldn't jump into a vessel their side of the house anyways. And even if the IMF bails countries out, all of the harm of the IMF being hawkish on austerity and all of the harm that austerity kicked in on their side of the house, so the people end up suffering anyway. OG then claims countries already face loads of backlash and opposition if they don't pay it <laughs> But they often, as they can see, can scapegoat other actors if it's not the vulture fuck, it is that Western country with imposed tariff that fuck you over. The previous opposition party that's likely willing to take the blame because they were the ones who took that huge amount of loads. It's unclear like the vulture fund as an entity will be the only scapegoat they have on their side of the house. At the end of OG, I want you to ask yourself what they've actually proven as an impact. Because the only benefit they end up trying to access is improving economic recovery. All of their other arguments are premises that lead to this, they're all necessary premises. So if any one of the premises they fail to prove, i.e. Walter has a huge amount of toxic leverage, that means that their case wouldn't work ultimately. We explain why, one, they don't do enough legwork to show why money goes to good use, two, the counterfactual of island of bailouts are better because it's a timeline problem, Three, governments and countries are not interchangeable actors. The country wants the debt repaid, but the ruling government party and the president also want to drag out that debt repayment. OG is out. OG. Either way, governments do what they can to postpone default, and either way, panicking investors will sell at a steep discount. What isn't symmetric is that courts deliver harsh terms, forcing states to overly cut spending on all sectors, which slows the economy, economic recovery and impoverishes its citizens. I think the first part of your POI is already untrue. Ryan explains that the biggest problem with buyer selling is a perception issue that like, first it starts off with all the impact that materialize after the first problem exists. Moving on to CG. I think CG's biggest problem is they never explain why other financial institutions like Goldman or the Central Bank have the incentive to then take up large amounts of distressed debt if vulture funds don't otherwise take debt. This is fully unproven outside CG and it's necessary for their argument to work. Here's why it's unlikely these institutions will take up more of this debt. Because IMEs often have much higher risk bottom lines that they have to leave because they have to vulture funds which have much higher risk appetite for taking losses. And the reason is because if the vulture funds are all set up in this way,